Great job, Jace. Thank you. Thank you, Tim and choir. What would it be like if everything that you heard was true? You didn't have to ever worry about anybody telling you a falsehood. Everything we said was true. The check really is in the mail. One size really does fit all. This is really not going to hurt. What would it be like? Now, I know many of you out there this morning are men and women of your words, faithful and true. Now, I, I tested Blake this morning. Now, you see, see, Blake went fishing yesterday, okay? And I gave him a chance to tell me about the one that got away. And I, I'm going to tell you, he, did, he didn't. He did not tell me about the one that got away. Instead, he said none of them got away. <laughs> oh, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> Just kidding. What if it were all true, everything we heard? What if there were space alien vehicles out in Area 51? We can't believe everything we hear, though, can we? Now, we, we don't have to be very old before we figure out that there's a lot of things out there that are not, that are not true, and we have to be discerning. We have to, we have to figure out what's right and what's not right. Well, one thing that I noticed this week in my study is that uh, I was discouraged to find out that there are a lot of Americans, one in four apparently, who think that money is more important than truth. That money is more important than truth. Uh, for example, one in four Americans think that it's okay to lie on their taxes. Well, this is a bad time of year to talk about that, isn't it? We should change the subject. Amen. I got an amen on that one. Jesus talks to us about our word. And he has some words to, to speak in um, Matthew chapter 5. Would you join me in your New Testament? Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 33. Matthew 5, 33. Get your bulletin out. Turn it over. Get a pencil or a pen. We'll take a couple of notes as we go along this morning. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 33 should say something close to this in your English translation. Again, I say to you, or excuse me, again, you have heard that it was said to those who lived long ago, don't break your oaths, keep your vows to the Lord. Now notice our text this morning begins with the word again. And that's because we are slowly working our way through a teaching of Jesus, and it, it, which takes up three chapters in the New Testament, Matthews 5, 6, and 7. And it's called by most people the Sermon on the Mount. It's a very famous teaching by Jesus. And in this section of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is talking about how to have a righteousness that's greater than the scribes and the Pharisees. Those were the religious leaders during Jesus' day, who he considered to be hypocrites. And he said, if you're going to be in the kingdom of the heavens, your righteousness has got to surpass that of the scribes and the Pharisees. It's got to surpass that of the hypocrites, the ones who say one thing and do another. Their understanding of God's word is insufficient. Now, Jesus also said, don't think when I start to teach that I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. Don't think that I've come to abolish the law, the Old Testament. I've come to fulfill it. And so as we look at Jesus' teaching, we've got to remember that he's not canceling out anything that God said before. And we can see why sometimes that people would think that by some of his remarks. He said, no, I'm not canceling it out. I've come to truly fulfill it. And in this particular section that we're looking at this morning, he's talking about oaths and vows. And in the Old Testament, an oath was something that a person would take to affirm the, uh, this, a statement that they're making, like a statement in court, for instance, that it's true, or a statement that they're making about a promise to do something uh, in the future. A vow 
is something that uh, a person would do when they were promising something to God. Something to God. Examples from the Old Testament, Ahab, a wicked king, and Elijah, the man of God. They had a, 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 uh, a relationship that was quite combative, and Ahab was usually trying to find Elijah so that he could kill him. And on one occasion, when Ahab the king was out looking for Elijah, the man of God, the prophet of God, he went from city to city, and he would ask the city, are you hiding Elijah from me? And of course, they knew better than to say yes, because the king would come in and destroy the city. But the king made them uh, promise on an oath, swear to me that you're not hiding Elijah from me. A vow, Hannah. Hannah was one of those Old Testament ladies who unfortunately found herself married to a guy who had more than one wife. Two wives in this particular instance. And in Hannah's case, the other wife had children, but she didn't have any. And that was very distressing to her. She was quite distraught over that. And, and one time when they had gone to the city, to the temple to worship, she made a vow to God. She said, God, if you will give me a son, then I will dedicate him to you she made a vow to the Lord and God heard her vow he answered her prayer he opened her womb she had a son she named him Samuel and Samuel grew up uh, in the temple and grew up to be a great man of God a vow Jephthah he's another man who made a vow he was a, a mighty warrior and he led the Israelites uh, against the Ammonites in battle and he he made a vow to the lord before the battle he said if you'll if you'll give me victory against the ammonites then when when i return home the very first thing that comes out of my house to greet me i will sacrifice to you and so the lord gave him victory over the ammonites and jephthah and the israelites were uh, triumphant and as he was coming home and he neared his house the first thing that came out of his house to greet him was his daughter, his only child. But because he had made a vow to the Lord. You see, vows and oaths were very important in the Old Testament. They were related to the commandment. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And God will not hold him blameless who takes his name in vain. Our newer translations say you should not misuse the name of the Lord, but I kind of like the King James Version there in the way that it renders it. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And so these were, these were serious things in the Old Testament, these oaths and these vows. But Jesus, as he's been doing in, in these, they're called antitheses, we're on the fourth one, the first one was about murder, he said, this is what you've heard, this is what I say. The second one was about adultery. He said, this is what you've heard, but here's what I say. The third one was about divorce. He said, here's what you've heard, this is what I say. And now this is the fourth one, about oaths and vows. He said, this is what you've heard, now here's what I say. Look at verse 34. But I myself say to you, not to swear at all. Not by heaven, because it's God's throne. Not by the earth, because it's God's footstool. Not toward Jerusalem, because it's the city of the great king. And don't swear by your head, because you can't make one hair black or white. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, Jesus didn't know about Vidal Sassoon. Jesus is God's son, he knows about everything. Black or white here in this particular context probably means not necessarily just the color or the appearance of hair, but young or old. Young or old. He's saying you can't make yourself young or old. You are locked into God's plan. In fact, what he's saying in all of these cases, don't swear by heaven, don't swear by the earth, don't swear toward Jerusalem. He's saying... All of these things belong to God. See, they had come up with this casuistry back in the first century. All of these complex laws and, and 
they, they used them sort of as a game that they would play. If you, if you swore by, by the name of God, then you had to do it. But if you swore and you didn't use God's name, then you didn't have to do it. And so there were all these different levels of truth, and it really just turned into a big game. In fact, he's using some actual oaths that they would use back then. Instead of using God's name, they would swear by heaven, or they would swear by earth, or they would swear toward Jerusalem. Now, here's how crazy it was. And I couldn't find in my study this week any of our English translations that take note of this, but when you go back to the words that Matthew has written down originally in the first uh, century when he was writing his gospel down, when he talks about swearing by heaven, he says, you don't swear by heaven. He uses the preposition in Greek, in, epsilon nu, and don't swear by heaven. And he says, don't swear by the earth. And then he switches prepositions when he mentions Jerusalem, and our English translators just sort of gloss over that, but he switches from N to ice. He swears, don't swear by heaven, don't swear by earth, don't swear toward Jerusalem. He was probably talking about one of the little games that they played back then because they said that if you swore by Jerusalem, then you had to fulfill your oath, but if you swore toward Jerusalem, you didn't have to fulfill your oath. That's the kind of games that they were playing. And Jesus comes along and he says, look, he's, he's quoting from Isaiah, heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool, where's the house that you'll build for me? He's saying all of this belongs to God. Don't play some game and say that just because you didn't swear a certain way that you don't have to tell the truth. That's nonsense. And he says, don't swear at all. Just don't do it. Now, when he says don't swear at all, rem he's not just talking about, he's not talking about profanity or cuss words. That's not the issue today. Those aren't good, but that's not our subject. The subject is these oaths and these vows. And he says, just don't do it. Don't do it. Don't play those games at all. You know, Herod uh, is an example in the New Testament of an oath that was taken. Now, remember this guy, he was, he was a piece of work, all right? He was living with his brother's wife, and John the Baptist was alive at that point. John was one of those preachers that just didn't pull his punches. And he wagged his finger at Herod and told Herod that that was wrong for him to be sleeping with his brother's wife. And he found himself where? He found himself in jail. Uh, Herod, and especially uh, his brother's wife, Herod's live-in, didn't like that at all. Well, Herod had a big shindig. He had a big party one time. And, and his stepdaughter, if you want to call her that, his brother's wife's daughter, a dance for them and pleased him and and he got up and he charged himself under oath under oath he said I'll give you anything you ask up to half of my kingdom well she ran over to her mother and said what should I ask for what should I ask for she hated John she hated John for telling her that her lifestyle was sinful and so she told her daughter go back and ask for John's head on a platter now, Herod wasn't exactly a friend of John, but he sort of protected him, and he kind of liked him, and he listened to him. But this woman came back and said, I want John's head on a platter. So he had two choices. He could either go back on his oath and look like a fool in, all, in front of all of his friends, or he could cut John's head off because he made the oath. What did he do? She brought John's head in and gave it to her mother on a platter. Jesus says don't do it. Just don't do it. Don't swear at all. Peter, well, it had to be a rough night. I would hate to live through that night. Wouldn't you? Three years you've followed this man. You've seen him do tremendous things. He, he speaks to storms and they listen. He raises the dead. He gives sight to the blind. He preaches and teaches in ways that make people go out into the wilderness where there's nothing to sit on, nothing to drink, nothing to eat, no air conditioning, no heater, and stay for days and listen to him. What must that have sounded like? And you followed him around for three years, and then suddenly, one night, everything goes completely wrong. In the middle of the night, he's arrested. The next morning, he's tried, and, and he's beaten. And you're not even sure what's going to happen next. It, it, it just... Things aren't good, good at all, and, and you're standing around at, the, at a distance watching, wondering what's going to happen next, afraid 
when he was arrested, Peter and all the other ones ran away because they weren't sure of what was going to happen next. And, and a girl comes up and she says, that accent of yours, you're, you're Galilean. You're one of those followers of that Jesus who's in there being tried by the Sanhedrin. No, I'm not. I don't know him. I don't know him. A little while later, she comes back. You are one of them. I can tell by your accent. You're Galilean. You're one of those. I swear to God I'm not him. I don't know him. A third time, she comes back. And they ask him, you, you are, you're one of his followers. And Peter called down curses on himself swearing that God would take his life away if he wasn't telling the truth. Jesus says, don't do it. Just don't do it. Why forbid all oaths? Let's write this down. Here's the first, our first note from today. Why forbid all oaths? Well, oaths imply that we should choose when to be truthful. See, an oath implies that, okay, I'm telling the truth now. So if you're telling the truth now, what were you doing earlier? It, and we put ourselves in a position to where if we're going to tell the truth always, we have to always what? We have to always swear an oath. Jesus says that's crazy. It's crazy. Just let it go. Don't swear at all by anything or anyone, anywhere. It's all God's anyway. Whatever you swear by is God's. And so you think you're swearing by something less than God, but it belongs to God. And so if you swear, you're swearing by God because God is listening. God is listening. And he's watching to see if you're going to do what you say you're going to do or he's listening to see if you're being honest about what you're saying. So here's what Jesus says in verse 37. Now I want to point two things out to you in the way that this verse is translated in your Bible. And they look pretty subtle at first, but they make a big difference. Now I want you to watch your English translation and listen to a very literal rendering of this verse. Here's what Jesus said. Let your word be yes for yes, and no for no. Anything more than these is from the evil one. Let your word be yes for yes and no for no. Now, when I first started studying this passage early in the week, it, um, I noticed right away I was wrestling with the English translations because they dropped uh, a couple of words in here. One word with, with the, um, it's the word halagos, lagos. It's the same word that John uses at the beginning of his, uh, at the beginning of his gospel. Uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning was the Lagos, Halagos, and the Lagos was with God, and the Lagos was God. That, that word is used here. It's a very general term. It's a big term. It just means word or speech, and, and it's in this verse. Jesus says, let your word, your word, you have a word. And he's saying, let your word be yes for yes and no for no. Now, a lot of the translations, what they do is they say, let your yes be yes and your no be no. And so they jettison halagos and yes becomes the subject of the sentence. All right, if that's too much grammar, I apologize, I'm through. Just get this. It says, let your word be yes for yes and no for no. Your word. You have a word. You know, we are made in the image of God. That's a tremendous, tremendous truth. And students of the Bible and theologians have not even begun to plumb the depths, I don't think, of what that statement truly means. And people have lived and died for generations, read that statement, and thought about it, prayed about it, meditated on it, written about it, and still, it's such a huge statement that nobody that I know of would claim to know all that that means. 
that we are made in the image of God. That's a tremendous statement. We can do things like God does. He creates, we procreate. We are like God. He speaks, we speak. You know, when God speaks, amazing things happen. In the book of Genesis, it says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void. Darkness was over the face of the deep. The Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was what? Light. God's Word is powerful. When God speaks, things happen. And we're made in His image. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that you can, say, that you can speak into existence the heavens and the earth. But we reflect God's glory, his word has power, and our word also is important. It reflects his word somehow. Now, Jesus makes this clear in the second part of this sentence. He says, uh, anything more than this, anything more than just your yes means yes and your no means no, anything more than this comes from tuporneiru. Now, tuporneiru can be taken one of two different ways. Literally, it says the evil. And some of our translations just say that it comes from evil. But usually in a statement like this, it's not just evil as a concept, but it's the evil one as a person. So you may have a translation that says comes from evil, and you may have one that says comes from the evil one. I fall down on the side that says it comes from the evil one. God, he's, Jesus is talking about God's word and how we're made in his image and our word is important. God's word is faithful. Our word should be faithful too. Why should our word be faithful? Well, look what happens. The enemy, the first thing he attacks, what was the first thing that Satan attacked in Genesis chapter 3 when he came after God, God's creation? The first thing that he attacked was people because people was at the top of the creation. He didn't go out and attack the seals or the, uh, or the polar ice caps or any of that stuff. He attacked people because all creation was made for people. And the way that he attacked people was to get them to do what? To doubt God's word. Did God really say your greatest struggle today and mine is whether or not you believe the book that's sitting in your lap right now. That's it. Folks, that's what it boils down to right there. Because if you believe that that Bible is a word from God, then it will change everything that you do in your life. And if you don't believe that that Bible is a word from God, you are moving in a different direction in your life. And you're moving to a different destination. Later in this sermon, Jesus is going to say, there's a, there's a narrow path and there's a wide path. There's people on the narrow path and they're on their way to life and there's a lot of people over here on the wide path and they're on their way to destruction. And the dividing point is that word that's right there in your lap because God has spoken and we have to decide, is it true? And we live in a world that's full of falsehood. How old were you when you first realized that not everything you heard was true? It happened so, so long ago that you can't even remember it, can you? As far back as we can think, we lived in a world where we had to decide whether something was true or not true. Can you imagine? Can you imagine living in a world where everything is true? There's no lie. I guess there would be no advertising. You know, that, we, we don't talk about this much. We talk about the fact that in heaven there'll be no dying. No crying, no sadness, no sorrow, no suffering. But guess what? Here's another thing there'll be nothing of in heaven. No lies. When we get to heaven, we'll be able to believe everything we hear. Won't that make life easier? I mean, trying to decide whether things are true or not, is it, that consumes a lot of our energy. But as followers of the Lord Jesus, we are proponents of truth. Made in the image of God, the image of God which was broken by sin is now being recrafted into the image of Christ. And part of that is that we are people who say yes when it's yes and no when it's no and nothing more. We don't need anything more. Here's, here's the second thing I'd like you to write down. Why, why be truthful? 
always. Why always be truthful? Well, we could write down a lot of things here, but here's what I'd like to write down today about this. Our lives, by our I mean followers of Jesus. If you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm talking to you this morning. If you're not, I pray that before you leave this room, you will be. But by our, I'm talking about followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our lives tempt people to doubt God's word. Whoa, really, Richard? That's right. Because we are representatives of the kingdom of God. And when we lie, it doesn't just reflect poorly on us. It reflects poorly on our Lord, and it reflects poorly on the word of God. Well, he's supposed to be a follower of Jesus, and he lies. Maybe none of that stuff's true. Now, let me, uh, let me add a couple of things here real quick. Truthfulness, honesty, is not an excuse to be cruel and mean, okay? Jesus is not talking about somebody coming up and saying, look, I'm sorry, but I'm a Christian, and I have to tell the truth in that dress, mmm, Look, I'm sorry, but I'm a Christian, and I just have to tell the truth, and I just had to come all the way over here and tell you that haircut, mm, 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 mm. No. That's not what Jesus is talking about. That's, that's childishness, okay? That's childishness. That's not what Jesus is talking about. Our words build people up. They don't tear people down. What did James say? Be quick to and slow to speak. You know, if, if you don't like uh, the color of my shirt, just be quick to listen and slow to speak, okay? <laughs> now, here's the other thing. Jesus is not, Jesus is giving a principle here. He's not giving us every potential application to this principle. That wouldn't be a sermon, that would be a teaching. And we've got to allow him to do this. He's not talking about a moral dilemma. Truth will, in this world in which we live, that's full of falsehood, to be truth speakers will sometimes put us in a moral dilemma. The classic example is in Exodus, where the Hebrew midwives were told by Pharaoh to throw the male babies, where? Into the river. Because they were scared of the Hebrews. And so they figured, here's how we'll trim their numbers. Tell the midwives, if it's a girl, let it live. If it's a boy, throw it in the river. They didn't do it. And when they were asked about it, they what? They lied. They lied. So they were not truthful, but God blessed them because this was an extraordinary circumstance. It was a moral dilemma. Jesus is not talking about moral dilemmas today. He's not saying that we have all of these excuses not to tell the truth. That's an extraordinary situation where somebody has to lie instead of tell the truth for greater goods. One other thing. What about contradictions? It, this kind of falls in the same category, but it's, it's worth bringing up. Uh, Jesus, when he was arrested, and they were bringing all these false charges against him, he refused to respond. He was silent. And finally, the head of the Sanhedrin was just fed up, and he charged Jesus, said, I adjure you by the living God. Tell us, are you the Christ or not? And he's asking Jesus to answer with an oath the charge that they've brought against him. And Jesus said, yes, it is as you said. Now, how are we to take that? Christians are divided on it. Some say, well, there it is. Jesus took an oath. The man told him that he had to answer under oath, and he did. Others say, no, 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 no. Look at his words. He didn't say the oath out loud. He just affirmed the reality of the situation. He wasn't swearing, and Christians are divided. But then we go to the letters of Paul, and Paul on several occasions seems to take an oath uh, as he writes to believers. 
He says, God is my witness. How I long for you to the Philippians. He said, God is my witness to the Roman Christians. How I remember you in all of my prayers. He seems to be doing exactly what Jesus says not to do. And so there's an apparent contradiction. And there's this tension in what Jesus is teaching us as we look closely at it. uh, And it begins to tear at us. But let me tell you something. If you're not used to this, then you just haven't been reading your Bible because when you start reading your Bible and let the Word of God speak to you, man, it's, it starts to knock some edges off. God's Word challenges us to the core of our being. And here's one of those segues where we're going down the road and there's an off-ramp. Some people would look at this and say, ah, it's just a, it's a contradiction. It's a, it's a sign that this really isn't God's Word, that it's confused it's, it's, it's going against itself. It makes no sense. I can't make any sense of it. And so they walk away. The same way that people did when Jesus told parables. They listened to those parables and they thought, what is he saying? It doesn't make any sense to me. I can't get it. And they turned around and they walked away. Some people take this statement and they try desperately to turn it into a very legalistic application. Some people take it very seriously, and I respect that. They choose not to take oaths. You don't have to take an oath when you go to court, even. You can affirm your statements. If you believe that God is telling you here that in court you shouldn't swear, nowhere should you swear, then don't do it. But we have to be careful. If we decide that Jesus is telling us here you shouldn't even take an oath in court, then be very careful that we don't look down our nose at someone else who takes this passage another way. Then what we've done is we've taken Jesus' teaching and we've turned it into the very thing that he was trying to destroy. Because what he said is, your righteousness has got to be greater than the scribes and the Pharisees. And one of the problems with the scribes and the Pharisees was that they thought they were better than everybody else. They had no humility whatsoever. They didn't pray like this. They prayed like this. Because they were so proud of themselves. And Jesus said on one occasion, the guy that goes in and prays like this and beats his breast, he's the one that really met God that day. And so we have to be very careful. We don't take Jesus' teaching and turn it into the very thing that he didn't want it to be. So what are we left with? What do we do? Well, there's a, there's a third group, and by the time we get here, it's a smaller group. And this is the group that says, okay, I don't completely understand this, but Jesus is talking, and I know Jesus, and he's always right, and God's word is always true, and sometimes I don't get it. So I'm not going to blame God's word. I'm going to change me. I am going to press forward. You see, the same thing happened when Jesus told parables. Some people walked away because they thought it was nonsense. Others came in and they said, what you're saying sounds like nonsense. We don't get it, but we know it must make sense because we know you and we trust you. Explain it to us. And he did. He did. Huh. Jesus. He, He just, he has a way of just, shaking you to the core of your being. Have you noticed that? You you can't come before the Word and leave the same. The Word always does some work on us. Would you bow your heads with me for a moment? What is the Word working on you this morning? I hope and pray that I'm talking to a room full of people this morning that wants to press forward press in to find out how this word applies to me, to my family, to my church. I'm going to hold on to it. I refuse to let go of it until it speaks to me. Just like Jacob when he wrestled with that man that one night. He didn't understand what was going on. He didn't understand what God was doing. But he refused to let go until he got a blessing. And when we come to the Word of God, sometimes, church, we just have to grab hold of it and wrestle and say, I refuse to let go until God blesses me. Are you willing to do that with God's Word? Just hang on. Don't let go. Because there is a blessing. It is God's Word. God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that should change his mind. Now let me ask you this. Are you a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ? 
Jesus went around teaching and people were drawn to him. And they said, there's something different here. There's something real. There's something powerful. Uh, this, is, this is what I expect to come from God. Authenticity, power, life change. If you've never given your heart to Christ, I want to give you the opportunity to do that today. We're going to have an invitation where we sing for a few moments and just give people a chance to respond. We're going to be standing and waiting on the Lord, listening to him. And if you're here today and you've never given your heart to Christ, and through this message or something, God is calling you and saying, this is it, this is your hour, now is the time to make your decision. I want you to leave your seat, come up here and sit on this front pew, and somebody's going to pray with you and show you how to give your heart to Christ and become a follower of Jesus. Now, maybe you're here today and you need to join the church, you need to be baptized, or you just need to come and get on your knees at the altar. Whatever God is saying to you, would you respond and say yes to him? Grab hold and don't let go. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for your word. We bow humbly before you and ask that you unfold your word.